In 1887, J.J. Thomson discovered the electron while doing experiments at the Cavendish Lab at Cambridge University. At that time, the fact that nature was made up of atoms and molecules was not fully accepted. Scientists still believed in the ether, which the michelson morley experiment finally disproved, also in 1887. So J.J. Thomson's experiment not only confirmed the existence of one of the most important elementary particles, the electron, he also showed that atoms are not the indestructible building blocks of matter that the Greeks had suggested, but rather parts of the structure of atoms and molecules. Although J.J. Thomson characterized the particles in the cathode ray tube, he could only get the charge to mass ratio, E over M. Was the mass and charge both very big or were they both very small? No one knew. So Thomson first suggested that electrons were uniformly distributed throughout the atom. This plum pudding model was incorrect. In a later ingenious experiment, Millikan was able to find the electron charge, and from the charge to mass ratio, this meant the mass of the electron was extremely small. It was 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Now, by small, we mean that it is about 1,800 times smaller than the smallest atom, the hydrogen atom. Hence, Thomson had discovered a new particle. After this, Ernest Rutherford of McGill University did scattering experiments and found that the nucleus indeed is tiny and massive, and most of the atom is a cloud of electrons. We had our first description of the structure of atoms. Let's look at the Thomson experiment in more detail. Now, science advances as new experimental techniques are discovered. Earlier, glass blowing techniques had evolved so that it was possible to embed metal in glass to act as electrodes and to evacuate the air from the tube. This cathode ray tube was a popular exhibit at science shows since the tube glowed. They were the first neon lights, although different gases were used than neon. Here is a part of the cathode ray tube. We now know that electrons boil off the cathode and move into the evacuated tube. If it is almost 100% evacuated, there is no glow, only a spot on the detection screen. At the time, it was not known if the particles were negative or positive. If there is a gas in the tube, it glows. However, if some air, like oxygen, nitrogen, or a noble gas was used, then these gases would fluoresce or glow. Here is an atom, and atoms have different energy, depending upon their state, and these energies are quantized. As the electron hits the atom, it is absorbed, and the molecule jumps into an excited energy state. This is unstable, and the energy cascades down and is emitted at different wavelengths, which makes the tube glow. Thomson was able to build on the work of others. Even though he could only get the charge to mass ratio, he knew he had discovered something significant. And he said, we have in the cathode rays matter in a new state. Let us look at some of the results. It was first thought that positive ions or cations are formed, and these move to the cathode, called canal waves. But these turned out to be charged atoms, like the ones we have just seen. However, the observed beam was negatively charged, moved in the opposite direction, and did not have the properties of charged atoms. Here, charged condenser plates have been added to the cathode ray tube, and the beam can be deflected upwards towards the positive plates. It can only be concluded that the beam is composed of negatively charged particles. Similar experiments with magnetic fields showed that the beam also has magnetic properties. By measuring these deflections and knowing the energy needed, Thomson was able to calculate the acceleration of the particles. Now, electrical force is just charge times field strength. So this must be the charge on the particle of the unknown electron, E, and the applied field strength, capital E, which is known from the experimental setup. Dividing by the mass, the experimental value of the ratio is minus 1.78 times 10 to the 8th coulombs per gram.
but this ratio does not give us the actual charge or the actual mass, only the ratio. Let us hear what Thomson had to say about the smallness of the electron. Would anything at first sight seem more impractical than a body which is so small that its mass is an insignificant fraction of the mass of an atom of hydrogen, which itself is so small that a crowd of these atoms equal in number to the population of the whole world would be too small to have been detected by any means then known to science. A common consequence of new discoveries is that new technologies follow. The discovery of the electron opened up many doors on the roads to quantum mechanics. Here is one consequence of the cathode ray tube, the TV tube. Thomson could not have known or envisioned television, but his step was in the right direction. Mass spectrometry is also a useful tool and is based upon the charge to mass ratio. Pass charged particles through an electric field, and depending upon its mass and velocity, the particles experience different deflections. This allows an accurate separation of particles based on their mass, and is the basis for the important analytical technique known as mass spectrometry. Of course, for this, we need to know the actual charge, and not just the charge to mass ratio. This was resolved by the famous Millikan oil drop experiment which I will discuss next.